join us today to talk about the the 10 most common misunderstandings about penetrant testing. Uh, we're going to work with two of our Magnaflux NDT experts, and they're going to walk you through today's webinar. Uh, please feel free to comment in the chat at any time. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Richard Reidenauer and Sherry Stockhausen of our Magnaflux team. Hi, I'm Sherry Stockhausen. I'm the Product Applications Manager at Magnaflux based in North America. I support the Penetrant product lines and the Magnetic Particle product lines. And I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Richard Reidenauer. I'm the Western U.S. Sales Manager for Magnaflux based out of California. Um, just to give you a quick history of my background, I got 35 plus years in NDT um, and certified in, in all the methods at one time or another. But my last 11 years, I've been with Magnaflux in a more concentrated mag and penetrant role. And uh, so I just, I do really appreciate everybody joining and hopefully this is kind of a basic understanding or misunderstanding some of you if you're level three types might not get too much out of it but we do have a little bit of new content in here that you might enjoy too so hang in there and try to try to listen to all of it um, i'll go into the the first slide here this is a quick introduction to what is liquid penetrant um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of it so here you've got your advantages very quick startup. Uh, what that is meaning is basically if you you can just literally grab a what we would call a kit, which is a penetrant cleaner developer, and you're off and running if you're up to say checking weld months, that sort of stuff. You do not necessarily need equipment with with the visible testing. Uh, you just have to make sure you comply with your uh, enough white light there. Your another advantage is locating very small discontinuities that are surface breaking. So, you know, one of the questions I've been asked has been, well, why are you using penetrant if you can see it with your eye? Well, there's a lot of times you can't see it with your eye. So this is what it's an enhancement of what you can see visually and uh, it'll pick stuff out. So uh, a wide variety of materials can be tested. This is very true with uh, liquid penetrant and we'll get into some more details on what you might want to stay away from also. Very portable and relatively low cost if you're doing like field inspections. Uh, the uh, portability is great um, and not that not as expensive as going out and purchasing some electronic equipment or uh, radiographic equipment to perform the NDT inspection. Uh, disadvantages, it'll only find surface breaking discontinuities. Uh, long process times, so in, in this process you have to let the penetrant, you apply the penetrant, it must seep down into the indications using capillary action. And then um, some of your materials could be permanently dis Colored. So we, we always advise if you've got some unique material to try to perform that or put apply penetrant in a way that you can see if it will be discolored before doing large lots of parts. Well, this is an interesting misunderstanding. The highest sensitivity penetrant is the best penetrant for my application. Most likely the best penetrant for an application will be the penetrant that is able to clearly and cost effectively identify indications. And there are five sensitivity levels in AMS 2644 ranging from level one half, very low sensitivity to level four, ultra high sensitivity. And AMS 2644 is the inspection penetrant specification that establishes the test procedures for the qualification and the approval of the penetrant materials. 
and approved penetrant materials are listed on the qualified products list or it's more commonly known as the QPL, QPL AMS 2644. A good first step in penetrant selection is a review of the governing specifications and any work procedures to see if there are required sensitivity levels. And then part surface finish and part geometry can be considered. High sensitivity penetrants work well on smooth machine surfaces. However, a high sensitivity penetrant can leave excessive fluorescent background on a rough cast part, and this will make inspection difficult and time consuming. Lower sensitivity penetrants are usually a better choice when inspecting rough surfaces. So the best penetrant for an application is determined by a governing specifications and also by an evaluation of the parts material characteristics um, such as part geometry and surface finish. Our next misunderstanding of penetrant indication is a defect. Um, this is completely not a wrong understanding. Uh, a lot of people, especially when a lot of your trainees, your level one types will think that everything that shows up is a is a defect. Um, so here's kind of an idea of uh, what the term discontinuity, how it's how it's explained or, or a description interruption or void in the normal physical structure of the configuration of a test piece. So what we're basically saying here is if you've got your penetrant the way that it works, if you look at the cracks, the laps, the seams, it's got uh, surface breaking tendencies. So the penetrant's allowed to seep into the indication. And that would be considered at in the beginning, uh, you're, you're showing an indication, not a defect. Uh, once you confirm it by doing by having additional tests, every indication must be evaluated. So we are saying if you see something on the surface, uh, do not actually call that a defect. What you're going to do is you're going to take and, and look into it and see what you can see. So you can have something as simple as a watermark could uh, actually look like a, a defect if it, if it should, if the way that it is running on the part. Um, you can do simply a solvent wipe on that, wipe it off, and if it doesn't come back, it is not going to be a defect. But you also have to have knowledge of how the parts created. So, and we're, what I'm going, what I'm saying here is, um, in the manufacturing process, you're going to have some indications that you might lead into or interpret as a defect but you want to make sure that your term terminology is correct when you're doing your report. In other words, um, if you've got a, say, a forging lap on a part, but you're doing, and uh, you're calling something a forging lap, but you're actually doing a casting, that's going to raise the eyes of, of people, and uh, you're going to confuse a lot of people with your with your terminology so and also the same goes for if you've got a uh, if you're doing a weldment um, you're going to have indications come out uh, that could weldments are pretty difficult if not clean properly to interpret so you've got to be very careful with that water washable penetrants are water based Actually, a penetrant can be water washable and not contain any water in its formula. What water washable penetrants do contain are surfactants, and the surfactants allow the penetrant to be removed or washed from the part surface with only water rinsing. Emulsifiers which are used in the methods B and D are not needed to remove water washable penetrants from parts. To help classify water-based penetrants, AMS 2644 now contains a separate category for method A penetrants that do contain water in their formulas. 
So in addition to the method A water washable category, there is a method AW category. Method AW is defined by AMS 2644 as a water washable penetrant that contains 20% or more water by volume in its formula. So just be aware of that, that there's now method A and method AW categories. So here's a another misunderstanding that uh, we should explain. With penetrants, you can pretty much inspect most materials. Um, on the next slide here, you've got uh, the difference, different materials, aluminums, cast irons, steel, stainless steels. Uh, also on here, you've got certain plastics. So there's a wide variety of penetrants or materials that you can use penetrant on, uh, all being ferrous or non-ferrous. Now, one thing that we want to, this is not like your magnetic particle, which people think are kind of go with the same, same theory sometimes. And I'm talking not to people that have the training, but the people that are just trying to get something inspected. They really don't understand the differences here. But with uh, mag particle, you can only do ferrous and you're not going to have non-ferrous. With your doing a breakage of the magnetic field is going to show the indication if you don't have any magnetic field in a non-ferrous part, you're not going to show any indications. Um, so again, these have to be surface breaking discontinuities, but we, we can see it. Um, but you will, do not want to use penetrants on very porous materials. Uh, what happens is you get a lot of background and you cannot, once you have too much background, what happens there is then you're not gonna be able to interpret the indications and look for defects with that heavy background so and then if you go into cleaning you try to clean a, a porous surface you can actually get to a point where you've cleaned too much and then it becomes your your test is basically invalid so um so why would you use penetrant if it's got these these tendencies where it might not show a good test over that particle so you want to and this is more on a engineering side, uh, design side, and level three call. Uh, you want to, if you don't have, let's say, in the instance of a refinery, and you've got to, you go up to the top of a tower, and there is absolutely zero uh, power up there, they can determine that, okay, we will do a penetrant test because of accessibility. Um, sometimes you also cannot get, if you're doing, uh, say, mag particle inside of a tight area like a boiler or a ship or something to that effect, and you can't get your your power mag your power pack to induce the magnetic field into the part. You might uh, turn and say that we'll go ahead and use the penetrant. So yeah. And you also have to keep in mind your visible penetrant is a very low sensitivity. So obviously, if they're looking for fine, tight cracks, probably visual, visual wouldn't be the way to go. But you could use a fluorescent also out in the field, too. I hear this misunderstanding frequently that penetrant will be able to penetrate a discontinuity that contains water. Unfortunately, penetrant cannot displace water or other liquid that fills or even partially fills a surface breaking discontinuity. And penetrant's not able to displace or penetrate through materials such as dust, oil, grease. And this really highlights the importance of not only cleaning parts prior to penetrant inspection, but thoroughly drying the parts and confirming that the parts are both clean and dry before the penetrant process. Okay, so we've got, uh, and here again, this is 
uh, people, they see others using penetrance out in the, say, uh, uh, the manufacturing facility, and they, they ask the question, tanks in an inspection booth are required for penetrant inspection. So uh, not necessarily. So you've got uh, different types of penetrants. Um, you've got your fluorescents that are used heavily in-house, where you've got a set of tanks uh, go through the line uh, with those tanks and then go to an inspection booth. And the next slide here we have is showing a what we call a penetrant processing booth. So as you can see, the green fluorescence in the, uh, that's an air purifier on the back. Um, so they're applying the penetrant, they're, they are letting it dwell, washing the penetrant, turning on dryers, and then um, do a, a developer, and then do the inspection all in this one booth here. So um, <clears throat> that kind of goes away from where's your tanks, where's your inspection booth. Well, here's an idea where you have all in one encompassing room. The next slide will show you um, the kind of the differences that you're going to see. So slide number one is a typical part where you're looking at, OK, they're checking for weldments. The weldments, they just want to make sure they don't have any cracks or large defects um, that might be missed by a visual inspection. And due to the part size, this was determined to be the best method for them. Uh, when you're looking at weldments and looking at uh, visible dye is heavily used on, on weldments because they will take a fairly low sensitivity to find something with that. So number two picture here is actually a picture where they've, they're using the tank method. So you've got the parts coming in, you've got the parts dipped here, and this would be a typical in-house lab type situation. Uh, number three, again, is it looks like this is some of it's in-house or inside a factory, uh, but due to the size of the parts, it's making it very difficult for them to dip this into a tank. So they're using what basically would be similar to a field inspection. So um, you can use, use th this is where your, your access accessibility and just convenience makes it, th they come to the conclusion, this is how we can inspect this. Penetrant is all that is needed to perform a penetrant inspection. Well, penetrant is certainly the star of the show, but in most applications, a pre-cleaner and developer will be used with the penetrant. And of course, UV lighting will be needed for fluorescent penetrant inspection. The emulsifiers will be used in the method B and method D penetrant processes. And there are a few limited applications where only penetrant may be used, such as manufacturing inspections of certain classifications of magnesium or aluminum castings. But of course, any specifications would need to be reviewed to confirm which penetrant inspection materials are required and the proper procedures. Uh, this UV lighting is required for all penetrant inspection. Uh, this might sound a little funny to some people, but uh, we have actually, as a manufacturer, we field many, many questions from people. And a lot of these questions are coming from people that uh, completely do not understand. So you have, you've got your UV lighting is, must be used with fluorescent penetrants. Um, you have to have, if you're doing it to a code or a specification, there are minimum, maximum lighting requirements along with um, fluorescent penetrants. You have your, where you have to keep the white light out, so you're limited to two foot candles of white light. Um, now, you go to visible penetrants, 
and this this is where you do not use any fluorescence and believe it or not we've actually fielded calls where they're asking to get a uv light for a visible penetrant inspection so people are out there but uh, and this is kind of why we put this all together is because of this so but um, visible dye, the only thing that's really needed is you have to have a very strong 100 foot candle minimum light to read the interpretation. So uh, what is a 100 foot candle minimum? A lot of times it can be obtained simply with just a flashlight, but um, uh, and you're looking at the parts. It, it's going to depend on the part size. Obviously, if you have a larger part, you're going to probably want to use some sort of like floodlights or whatever. So. Penetrant inspection should be the final check in a manufacturing process. It may be, but not necessarily. In many situations, penetrant inspection is useful immediately following any manufacturing process that has the potential to cause surface breaking discontinuities. And the reason why this is important is parts can be screened out earlier in the manufacturing process, which saves time and cost. It doesn't make sense to continue processing a part if there's an issue with it and it can possibly be reworked. And there are even instances where penetrant inspection may be performed more than once during the manufacture of a part. And as I just mentioned, especially if parts are reworked, they would be rerouted through the penetrant inspection process. Here is no training is necessary to perform liquid penetrant inspection. Uh, this is a very big misunderstanding. Um, are we telling everyone that they must uh, they must have training? No. Are we recommending it to people? Absolutely. Um, we've had, and in my experience, I've seen some crazy things happen when it comes to uh, people that are inexperienced and, and even our, our customer service fielding calls and, and some of the sales managers working with people, um, trying to make them understand the penitent process. One of the first questions we, we pose to them is, do you understand that the training is necessary just to get an understanding? Uh, why do we do this? Uh, simply for the fact we've seen more than not, than not a lot of people will take and apply in a visual penetrant and they'll take their cleaner and spray it right onto the part and basically wash out all the penetrant and not understand why they can't find defects. Um, so, it seems a, to be a very simple process, but there is a lot of factors that could go with the process, especially if you're working inside a lab to aerospace specifications. You, your processes must be pretty much right on point, uh, not only from the from the standpoint of your your operator that's processing the parts, but you also have process processes that must be daily checked so you've got uh, there's a lot of factors so what we're saying is um, we recommend the training now if you're we actually we sell to let's say a racing team where basically somebody gets into a a wreck and they they do a quick quick check on the frame of the uh car itself okay do you need to be certified for that no would it be recommended to have training yes um, but so a lot of times when you get into actual between the difference between training for certification and training just to know how to apply stuff and how it the system actually works which would we would we consider that as a level one um, we feel it's necessary that you'd ha you should have that. So just to give you an idea on training, um, your hours for the NAS 410, which is aerospace, uh, 
or classroom, you, you must to perform to a level one status, 16 hours of uh, in in class training to go to level two, you need an additional 16 or 32 hours total to become a level two. On top of that, it's recommended for a level one, 130 hours of actually working in the method, watching, uh, seeing how it's done, and to for level one that is, and level two is 270 hours or a total of 400 hours. So the training is it's something to you, you really want to uh, take a look at and, and make sure your people are following the correct steps in the liquid penetrant process. It could be very, very easy for you to invalidate a test if you don't. So if you ha have any questions, please feel to submit them in the chat. So one question that was emailed in beforehand um, was asking about when the new category of method AW penetrant was added to AMS 2644. Richard and Sherry, can you comment on that? When um, method AW was added to AMS 2644? Uh, yes, I, I can answer that. Uh, it was added to AMS 2644 in the G revision, which was in April of 2019, and it's now AMS 2644 is now revision H, and revision H uh, was issued this past summer, July of 2020. So it is a relatively recent category, and it does clarify things to have a method A and a method AW as water-based penetrants become, you know, you know, in greater use out in the field. I think they weren't used that much in the past, but for environmental reasons, they are becoming a focal point. So to clarify things, the method A and method AW categories in AMS 2644 do help. Perfect, thank you, Sherry. Another question I have here is, what is the recommended in-process test for water content of method AW penetrants? Okay, there is a bit of a difference there. And for the in-process penetrant, I would reference ASTM E1417, it's um, table one. But for the method AW penetrants, the water content test for in-process penetrants is a weekly check and it's with a refractometer. So it, it's a relatively quick test just to check the concentration of really the water, the water content, because these are water-based penetrants in method AW. And this does differ from the method A penetrance, which the water content check is a monthly check and it is a laboratory test. A uh, common method would be a distillation method or a titration method, so it's not as simple. So there's a difference in the test methods for the water content check, and there's also a difference in the frequency. For the water base, the method AW, that's a weekly check. It can be run right on the line using a handheld refractometer. Okay, and then to expand upon that, Sherry, um, is there any more information you can share about how to determine which tests are needed for in-process penetrant? Yes. We in North America work heavily with AMS 2644 and ASTM E1417. So the best place to go for the North American people is typically it's table one in ASTM E1417. Um, there are other requirements for in-process checks. So if you're doing specific work for OEMs, uh, you would need to compile that all together, but this a good starting point would definitely be to take a look at table one in ASTM E1417. Excellent, thank you. 
And then I did see a, a question come in uh, to the chat talking about uh, recommended wash nozzles for FPI lines. Can you share some of your experience there, Sherry? I do know that um, there's a requirement. Um, there's some requirements. And again, this is going to depend on specifics of the customers and the OEMs, but it's typically a coarse water spray. And in some cases I've seen where it needs to be, um, it's specified that it needs to be a fan shaped spray. Um, so again, I would default to uh, whatever specifications or work procedures. Definitely need to be looking at your specifications. They, they do have most of your distributors throughout the US will, um, or probably worldwide, um, but I'll speak for the US distributors, will have those available for you. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is you also have uh with your with your spray nozzle you before it gets there you also have to have in a aerospace environment or specification you must have your your penetrant water water temperature and pressure gauges also so it's it's a it's a big combined factor um but definitely refer to your your specs and if you have any questions on that again if you if you're a little unsure, we can take it offline and uh, answer your questions, answer more questions for you. DB. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so if anyone else has any specifics they want to get into, please give us a call uh, or email support at magnaflux.com. That way we can get you to the right person depending on, on your application.